So as you can see from this service of joy and excitement and palms of one of the most fun choral anthems that there is out there of the playfulness and the excitement, um, but also the passages that we have read and the hymn that we have just sung, there is both joy and both very deep, hard, minor key work happening. And that's the hard place. The hard place that squeezes us, that is difficult, um, that can be very depressing. But that also carries great joy and hope and light all at the same time because of how Jesus went through the hard place this holy week. It's very natural for all of us as human beings to do anything to avoid pain and to be happy and to keep that happiness and that contentment happening. Um, but most of us know that life isn't fair and something in life will happen that will remind us of that and will land us in a hard place that we would have done anything or given anything to avoid. This week is about following Jesus to those hard places. This week is about naming them in honesty. This week is about learning how Jesus brought hope and light and joy into really hard places. And so we go to our own hard places knowing that they're not the bubbly kind of joy that we would prefer in life, but that there is also a deep current of hope that is there to carry us through to when the sun shines a little bit brighter. So as we follow Christ, I wanna go back to John chapter 10 and back up a little bit um, to set the stage for going in to this week. Do you have that? Yep, perfect. So the Jewish opposition circled around Jesus. This is while he's just given um, that great talk of I am the good shepherd, my sheep know my voice. How long will you test our patience? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Okay, who's had that moment? Like, I can't do this anymore. Just tell me, right? And Jesus answered, I have told you. Not exactly the answer anyone likes to hear. Um, but you don't believe. The works I do in my Father's name testify about me. But you don't believe because you don't belong to my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Yeah, ouch. That hurts as much as it sounds. And if you were listening to that and being told that because you were asking that was because you didn't believe and weren't in the practice of following the Good Shepherd and hadn't built in that DNA into who you are of knowing their vo of his voice. So again, the Jewish opposition picked up stones in order to stone Jesus. Now, I'm skipping around because this would take us a really long time to go through verse by verse, but please pull out your Bibles and, and read through with me if you like. Um, so Jesus makes it out, but again, they wanted to arrest him, and he escaped from them. And so Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had baptized at first, and he stayed there. And many people came to him. John didn't do any miraculous signs, they said, but everything John said about this man was true, and many believed in Jesus there. Barry, could you bring up our map again? And can we just all give mad props to Barry for this heavy PowerPoint sermon? Um, so Jesus was in Jerusalem. All down south, yep. And that was when he escaped from trying to be both stoned or rested, and then went all the way up to Salim and Anon, um, where John had been baptizing. So um, that's on foot, <laughs> remember? That's a long way. That's a, okay, it's time to peace out. Um, this is not going to work in this area. And so... So Jesus leaves that place and goes up. And now this is where he is when he hears word that Lazarus is sick. But he stays there. All right. And then just to help Barry um, out, 
to go back to Lazarus means that he's got to go back to Bethany all the way down. And look how close Bethany is to Jerusalem. They're right next to each other. So this is a big deal to go back to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Okay, let's bring up the scripture, Barry. So people are believing him. He's teaching. Everything John said about this man was true. Awesome. Life is good and anon. Um, and then Lazarus comes um, ill, and we hear this news. And Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. When he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was. He stayed all that way north. And after two days, he said again to his disciples, no, let's return to Judea again. The disciples replied, are you out of your mind? That was my insert. Rabbi, the Jewish opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? Um, yeah, that is not reasonable. Keep going. Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sakes, I'm glad that I wasn't there so that you can believe. But we've got to go to him. Let's go to him. Now, Thomas... The one called Didymus, which means the twin, this is before, now we only remember him as doubting Thomas, but Thomas then said to the other disciples, let us go too so that we may die with Jesus. Say what, whoa? Who knew that this was the same doubting Thomas? This is the same, the very same. And Thomas is the one who gets the disciples to go with Jesus to the hard place. Kind of helps in understanding what happens after Jesus' death, right? Because Thomas cashed in all his chips. He's like, let's go. And his worst fear happened. So of course, in that moment, he's going to need the rest of the disciples to help him out. He's going to need Jesus to help him out, to show him that that wasn't the end because he went all in. This right here is why we don't ever do faith alone. Because there will be times when we cash in all of what we have to go to the hard place. And when another hard place comes up just a few days later, we are spent. We don't have anything left to give to that hard place. That's why we need other people with us who do still have something to give, who can cover us then just as we covered them before. That's why we do this together. And so they go to the hard place. They go all that way back south, back to Bethany. Um, and we know the story, right? Jesus heals Lazarus. And, and heals him as in raises him from the dead and brings him back out. And a lot of the Jews believe um, because, whoa, that's, that's, that's a moment. That's a day. Um, but then there were others, um, who, many of the Jews who came with Mary and saw what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them, we all have tattletales, whether in we're first grade or adults, went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisee called together a council and said, what are we going to do? All right, the meetings start. And this is Caiaphas, the high priest. Don't you see that it is better for you that one man die for the people rather than the whole nation be destroyed? This is the only time in the gospel traditions that we have openly named the threat of the Roman Empire and how it affects Jesus and how it affects Jesus as a Jew and the Sanhedrin as Jews. And that the little piece that they've been able to whittle out is under threat um, and their temple is under threat. This is the place that we see that Jesus isn't killed from malicious intent. At worst, it's about self-preservation. And I think that's something that each and every one of us can identify with. Here's the hard thing about hard places. The further we get out from them historically, the easier with hindsight we're able to paint the decision and the people involved with the decisions into a black and white, a good and a bad problem is, it's always more complex than that. 
there is always truth and understandable fear at work on whatever side that we've decided to delineate. And this is a window into the hard place, the very time it was a hard place, before we know the end of the story, before we know what the actual threat was versus the perceived threat. This is the complexity that we deal with in the hard places we face today. And the way that the Sanhedrin decided to deal with their hard place was that from that day on, they plotted to kill Jesus. Therefore, Jesus was no longer active in public ministry among the Jewish leaders. Instead, he left Jerusalem and went to a place near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, where he stayed with his disciples. Can we go back to the map, Barry? So I just want to show that we go to hard places, but we go to hard places smartly. When the tensions arose this much, Jesus did take a step back and do something differently. And at the map, if you can see, it doesn't go all the way back to Salim and Anon, but Ephraim is right there in between. So he goes back to a middle place. He does find some safe ground. Before he goes back, Palm Sunday, back to Jerusalem, when all the crowds are gathered, when everyone's remembering the Passover, the freedom from slavery in Egypt. And if you're under Roman occupation and empire, you're going to be wanting that freedom again and wanting something from Jesus that those who are there in the Sanhedrin to protect the peace with the Roman occupiers are going to be really scared of. All right, let's go back to scripture. It was almost time for the Jewish Passover, and many people went from the countryside up to Jerusalem to purify themselves through ritual watching before the Passover. They were looking for Jesus. They wanted Jesus. They wanted freedom. Can you blame them? They wanted salvation. And as they spoke to each other in the temple, they said, what do you think? He won't come to the festival, will he? The chief priests and Pharisees had given orders that anyone who knew where he was should report it so they could arrest him. We'll keep going to the next scripture. And the crowd who had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead were testifying about him. That's why the crowd came to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign that he had done. And, you know, it lines up liturgically. So he's already saved someone from the dead. And now we have all of the Jews gathered in for Passover, for remembering freedom. Now is the time. This is the moment. Freedom is here. Salvation is here. Hosanna. And so the crowd's there. And the Pharisees say to each other, see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the whole world is following him. Keep going. Oh, sorry, Barry. That's where I ended. (laughs) The whole world's following him because that is where our scripture from this morning um, comes up. Um, And we have Jesus coming into Jerusalem. And as we um, continue this, Barry, if you could bring the map back up. We have Jesus coming in, um, but he's not going to stay. He's going to be there for the entrance, but he's not going to stay to raise a revolution. He's going to go back out. Um, We don't know where he went until Monday, Thursday, because the scripture says he departed and hid. Um, But then after Monday, Thursday, after that Last Supper, after sharing Passover, as we will do on Thursday this week, he's going to go across the Kidron Valley. Um, That's just, it's not on this map because it's just outside of Jerusalem. Um, So um, the dots would be so close together, they'd be indistinguishable. Um, But that's the eastern side of the old city of Jerusalem, and it's the King's Valley. Um, It was the main burial grounds in the Second Temple period. And that's where we're going to have Jesus in the garden praying and then later arrested. So there are hard places coming for us and that came for Jesus. 
And Jesus is going to go to those hard places. But he's also going to stage it in a way that he goes and steps back and regroups and goes back again. He's going to stage within himself knowing when the time is. And even when that time is there, he's going to be praying blood, sweat, and tears that it not be, that there be another way. Because even Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, didn't want to go to the hard place. But he did. So when we encounter hard places ourselves, when we cry and cry and cry and can't get out of bed in the morning, think of Jesus in the garden, praying blood, sweat, and tears. But also think of Jesus going to the hard places. He did. And he had disciples that rallied around him, led by Thomas, to do it. And he had disciples abandoning him. There are going to be times when we go to the hard places alone. And there are going to be times when we go through the hard places and our village is there. And what I am asking for us is practice in going to the hard places together as a church. Because new life and new hope always comes faster and more powerfully when we're there as a village than when we're there alone. I can't promise us no hard places. That's not the way the world works until Jesus gets his butt back for good. So until that point, we will have hard places that bring out our blood, sweat, and tears. What I can promise is to build, do all that I can to build a community, to build a village that isn't scared of the hard places and goes with, to stand with people when they need it the most. And that is exactly what one of our colleagues is doing this very hour, this very week. Meredith Arnold is a colleague of Bill's and my um, here in our conference and in a church she just served at in Southern Maryland District. Um, Jalen is the girl who was injured in the Great Mill shooting and who eventually had to be taken off of life support and died. Meredith was there. Jalen was the best friend of her daughter while she was appointed there, and they continued their friendship in Maryland's new, Meredith's new appointment in Annapolis. She was there with the family while Jalen was on life support and baptized her. And she was there to walk the family through Jalen's death. And this holy week, she is there to officiate Jalen's funeral as she moves through Monday, Thursday, through Christ's funeral and the hope of resurrection. The hard places of our world are real. There was a march yesterday organized by five high school students because hard places shouldn't be the places that we have to go to every single day of our lives. Hard places shouldn't be schools. Hard places will come, yes, but hard places should be at some point the exception and not a daily rule. Because then the spirit withers and breaks and the brittle stress and anxiety and fear and trauma that that builds in our bodies and our souls. So as people of faith who follow Christ... What do we do? When do we act out of self-preservation? And when do we put our bodies on the line? One of the pictures that has been circulating um, from this past March is a banner from the suffrage movement from 1913 to 1920. The young are at the gates. I want us to remember that Jesus was 33 in doing all this. 
that the Methodism movement exists because of college students and tutors on a campus in Oxford, England from the age of 14 to 30. And now we have a movement from our youth once more. Will we open the gates? Will we join and risk our bodies and be the village that shows up in the hard places? That's our question this holy week. Jesus goes, will we follow? The only way to follow, the only way to go to hard places that are way beyond what we can deal with is to do so with all of the power of God flooding through our bodies and our souls. But sometimes we stop that power and so we come to confession. Will you pray with us? Lord, forgive, forgive us, us. For, for we are fragmented persons. We go, go many directions at once. We seek opposite goals. We serve contradictory causes. We believe in liberation. We live oppression. We speak peace. We practice violence. We shout justice, we walk in injustice. We preach love, we practice hate. Through your compassion, have mercy on us and make us whole. Enable us to discern your voice among the dissonant voices. Amen. Please take time now in silent prayers of confession. May Almighty God, who caused the light to shine in the darkness, even when the darkness could not understand it, shine that same light in our hearts, bringing understanding to our souls, deliverance from the bondage of sin, and fruit worthy of repentance. And the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, may we be cleansed from all unrighteousness. Barry, we're going to skip forward um, until the part about Jesus, holy are you. After, well, here. Let's shout together, Hosanna. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Pastor Bill. <laughs> no problem. Okay, so the holy, 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 we'll say that all together because, you know, it's about God save us today. It is. Please join me. Holy, 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 holy Lord, Lord, God of power and might, heaven, heaven and, and earth are, are full of your glory. glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you. And blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When you gave him to save us from our sin, your spirit led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. When he suffered and died on a cross for our sin, you raised him to life presented him alive to the apostles during 40 days and exalted him at your right hand. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from the slavery of sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Now, when we, your people, prepare for the yearly feast of Easter, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, that during these 40 days of Lent, we may be gifted and graced to reaffirm the covenant you made with us through Christ. 
We meet Christ in the hard place, the night where he gave himself up for us. The night he faced abandonment, betrayal, torture, and death. And we meet him remembering a night in which he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Remember me. How likewise when the supper was over, he took the cup and after giving thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink from this all of you for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and in thanksgiving as a holy and a living sacrifice, those hard places, as a holy and a living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering, with Christ's sacrifice, with Christ's hard place, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has Christ died. Has died. Christ, Christ is, is risen, risen, and Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. again. For all the hard places <laughs> that Christ faced, that our mothers and fathers, our holy parents of faith faced, for the hard places we face today, God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us who are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ so that we might be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. God, make us one with you, one with one another, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Because it is in the love of your son, Jesus Christ. It is in the power of your Holy Spirit, and it is in the strength and the support of your holy community, the church, that this journey, going to the hard places, is possible now and always. Amen. Amen. Siblings, may we never forget that we serve a Savior who is whole, as we read in that letter to the Philippians, but who chose to become broken so that we who are broken might be made whole. A Savior who was full, but who chose to empty himself so that we who are empty may be filled. As Christ did not fear death, as Christ, let's be honest, he feared it. As Christ did not let his fear stop him and moving through death, may we not let our fears of the hard places stop us from moving through them. And this is the meal that we take to give ourselves the power and the courage and the strength that we need to meet those hard places, doing exactly as Christ instructed us to and remembering him. If four people would come and join um, Bill and myself up front, we will serve by intention, um, kind of. We'll give you a piece of bread and there'll be a cup um, and then there is gluten-free option available as well. will be right there in the middle, just off the steps. How do you want to handle the bread? With my hands? I know. Take two. Sorry. We're ready.
Speak 